Um, this is a really, when Tom gave me the, I, you know, the, the, the initial kernel for this talk, the title, uh, it was really difficult. I started this talk about eight times. It's just, it's a huge subject. And no matter how you uh, approach it, you realize that you're leaving something important out. And um, um, part of that is because, of course, superheroes, when you use the phrase superhero, you're talking about something that's entered every single aspect of our culture. You cannot name a medium that hasn't just been almost oversaturated uh, uh, with uh, uh, ideas uh, and types of the superhero. Um, just to give you an idea, from 1978 alone on, uh, Box Office Mojo lists um, um, 88 movies in the superhero category. Uh, and that's the release of Superman, by the way, with Christopher Reeve. And of those 88 um, movies, uh, that's eight and a half billion dollars in in you know um, uh, uh, in 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 uh, box office and the, and the, and to give you an idea of how that breaks down the widespread release films which are far fewer than 88 films averaged 105 million dollars each and that's from 1978 dollars so you know this is a massive phenomena um, you know think you add in comic books toy sales collectibles video games uh, TV show revenue. Um, we really we're talking probably a couple trillion dollars uh, in, the last, in, in the last few decades. Uh, San Diego Comic Con, recently you've all heard of the San Diego Comic Con, right? Because now everybody reports on it. And the reason they report on it is a couple of years ago, the San Diego Comic Con had to put a cap on how many people could come to their event. They have 130,000 people now that get into their event and tens of thousands more that can't get in. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the superhero is one of the primary, uh, if not the primary catalyst behind this explosion of what we call fandom. Who here has an action figure at home? Okay. Is it Cherry? Is it in the package? Huh? Huh? You know, Weird Al, all my action figures are Cherry, you know? <laughs> you know, this is a big thing in our culture, the collecting of all this ephemera and memorabilia and chatting online and having all these places that we visit. And, and creating an identity through this thing we call fandom. Um, superhero is one of the main reasons we do that. Um, noted colleges and universities have even offered courses on the history and psychology of the superhero. Tufts University offered a class called American Superheroes, Power, Politics, and Morality. Uh, University of North Texas, the mythic rhetoric of superheroes. And University of California at Irvine, the science of superheroes. How would you like it if you were a mom and a dad paying like 60 grand a year or whatever for your kid to go to college and they were taking the science of superheroes? Um, so this is exalted stuff. This is big stuff. This is universalist stuff. But it has very humble beginnings in our culture, um, very human beginnings. And really where it has its beginnings is not where you'd expect. What people think is that the beginnings of the superhero go back to the Greek and Roman times. Um, and we think of the Greek gods. And certainly those helped shape our ideas of the heroic and uh, uh, beings of su super uh, ability or supra natural ability e exist all through you know, human storytelling and, and folklore. But it really is in folklore and the development of mass media that you see the idea of the superhero begin to take some sort of the shape that we see it in today. Um, particularly when we get into things like pulp writing, uh, comic strips, and radio, um, which is really where the first heroes that were mass produced and you could get stuff that related to them, you know, buy costumes or buy, you know, books or, you know, buy things related to them uh, comes from. Um, it's interesting that The Shadow and Lone Ranger and Tarzan uh, predate Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and John Carter of Mars in all those mediums um, because Tarzan, the Shadow, and the Lone Ranger are human figures. Uh, even the Shadow, which has some semblance of superhuman ability, is really a, is more of a, of a human character. Um, but all of those, uh, you know, those Shadow and the Lone Ranger both have secret identities. And with Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and John Carter, what you have is you have a moving out, a slow moving out into this idea of the super, you know, of, of people that are involved in things that no human being could possibly ever be involved in. Um, and, you know, going to outer space and shooting ray guns and fighting, you know, great big monsters. 
Um, and it's after that onslaught of pulp writing through people like Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert Howard and comic strips and radio serials um, that you have the comic book, the comic book hits. Now there were comic books um, for a long time before there were superheroes and they would reprint Bible stories and historical events and there was a Sheena, Queen of the Jungle uh, had a comic. Um, one of these other uh, figures here had, had a comic. Um, but it really, it really wasn't until Batman and Superman came along that we had comics, um, which of course were the ultimate shaping force of how we view the superhero. And um, uh, the, there are a few things though about what, what the, all this culture had in common that I think sort of inexorably led to Superman and Batman. Um, one was uh, that all of this stuff uh, was offered up in, in the idea of the serial format. We all know what a serial format is, right? It's where you have a cliffhanger at the end and you don't know how the hero's going to get out of it. And then the, the next series, you know, part of it starts and then we find out how the hero got out of the impossible situation. So you have this idea that even these human people wind up in situations where they are um, sort of superhuman because they're finding ways to get out of these jams time and time again, we begin to think of them in terms of eternity. We begin to think of them in terms of immortality. We begin to ascribe to them a different sense of power. Um, and also, um, this stuff is all steeped in, in juvenilia. These are all stories for children. That's something to, something to really think about because these stories are often kind of dark. They're kind of violent. They're kind of scary. Um, and um, they're also very, very simple. Um, they, um, you know, you have this idea of simple good and evil stereotypes and they are uh, uh, very simple situations. You, you have a hero, there's a, something being done, the hero comes, he uses his power and what, the problem goes away. So this, you know, onslaught of all of these, these massively popular forms lead us to Superman and Batman appearing in 1938 and 1939 as part of DC Comics. In fact, Superman, uh, you know, came first and then they thought Superman was so popular that they went ahead and they worked with this guy named Bob Kane uh, to start doing Batman. Um, and the thing about Superman and Batman and all these other characters that they had in common is they were good guys. They were understood at that time as good guys. Superman was all truth, justice, and the American way. Um, and you could, have super, you could have superheroes that were um, dangerous. You know, Batman killed people in his first comic. You know, uh, he was a vigilante, he was pursued by the police. Um, definitely working outside the law. Um, those are the two major models, by the way, of superhero is the protector god figure and, uh, uh, and the vigilante, uh, uh, who, who is usually human, um, uh, a human character. Superman, of course, is, is not a human being. He's an, he's an alien on some level. Um, but Superman is the truth, justice, and the American way figure. And, uh, you know, characters like the Batman and the Green Hornet are, are, are uh, vigilantes. Um, but even though they're vigilantes, even though, even though they're dangerous characters, uh, and the police aren't into them doing what they do, when you get close to them in the, in the shows, or in the comics, or in whatever medium, what do you discover about them? They're really good guys. They just want to help the police out. The police aren't doing such a good job. Uh, they need help. They don't have all the tools they need. They're held back sometimes by the law. Um, these are not characters driven by damaged emotions or damaged uh, uh, psychology. Uh, we know that about them. We know that they have gone through hard times or whatever, but that's not what motivates them in these stories. These stories are usually s simpler in these earlier comics and they don't get into that. Now, am I, am, am I okay? Am I, am I boring or anything crazy? Uh, I just want to make sure I get through all this so that uh, then I can do my Donald Duck impression because that'll be much more entertaining. Um, so, um, and of course, at this time, we can begin to identify the chief things that make the superhero popular. One is they have superpowers, right? We, we, love to, we, we love to engage at the level of the superhero that has the ability to do something that we wish we could do like fly or see through things or bend metal with their bare hands. Uh, they have super weapons. Um, and, you know, that sort of speaks for itself, batarangs and, you know, all this cool gear uh, um, uh, that you can now go buy at Radio Shack. Um, super vehicles, uh, you know, the Batmobile and all that kind of thing. Uh, super hideouts, they have a lair, they have a man cave. Uh, 
a man cave that they go, ooh, that they can go to. And secret identities. Um, they get to be more than one kind of person. And they get to go back and forth between two worlds. Um, uh, these days they, they, they call that um, ripe for being found by 60 minutes. But um, that, is, uh, that is the idea of these people being uh, romantic figures. They live in a romantic existence. It's full of glamour. It's full of adventure. Um, and so they're idealized figures. And for many, many, many years we see the superhero as an idealized figure on every level. Superheroes are good guys. That's how we understand them. And then something starts to happen in the 1970s. In the 1970s there are a whole variety of forces that come together and they contribute to a changing character in the way the superhero is presented and the way the superhero is embraced by the American public. And it is a trend which has continued on up into this day. Uh, and I want to talk about what some of those forces were, but what some of those, some of those changes in the superhero were, that suddenly they were more human than super. We began to relate to the superhero as more of that person behind the mask or whatever. Uh, and the problems that they were having and the things that drove them to do what they do and this, their psychology and whatnot. Um, they were certainly less of a stand-in for the idea of ultimate power or goodness. Don't you know that Watergate had an effect, eh? <laughs> we weren't just throwing our trust around at, at characters, especially characters that run around with their underwear on the outside. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, and in the middle of this, the superhero is more popular than ever. In fact, this is sort of the rebirth of the superhero. The superhero had taken kind of a beating. Anybody remember the Batman TV show? Okay, look, we all love Adam West, right? We all love the Batman TV show, but it was basically the equivalent of, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's silly. It cannot get any sillier. It did not take Batman seriously at all. In fact, there were vast intimate animations about Batman, he maybe even being gay or something on that show. I mean, it's just, it's so camp, it's so over the top. Um, and it sort of spells a little bit how the superhero has fallen from the, you know, kind of graces that he'd had before. And I want to say I think that's a good thing. I want to talk about why and I want to talk about these shaping forces. Number one, I think you have uh, technological advances. And we deal with this particularly today. You know, we all know the, the thing about how the computer ship shrinks by increments. And so now we have things that Batman had on his utility belt. Everybody has them, you know. Um, and this allows us uh, to talk to one another more quickly. And uh, we talk about internet memes. And we talk about the idea that um, superheroes, you know, used to have, um, there was a limit to how you could spread the story of the superhero. And now things can literally happen overnight. And they can, be, they can sweep and get bigger much quicker, and they tend to have a shorter shelf life as, as, as well. In the middle of that, um, um, it's easier, in a, it being easier for us to get the stories, um, I think it makes it harder to relate those characters to the real world. And the reason is because we have a constant flood of information that challenges our idea that the superhero is capable of changing the world. Because the world is darker and more complex and scarier to us than it was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Because we now have a bigger picture of what's going on in the world. And we have a much, you know, we have a, 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 a bigger understanding of, of how big a lot of the problems in the world are. There's a great um, novel, and I'm going to be going through this talk, and I'm going to be mentioning uh, graphic novels to you. Um, if you want to understand the superhero today, go get these graphic novels. It's all you'll ever need to read about the superhero, and then you can decide. But these are the classics. These are the ones that have really shaped the the um, uh, the, the the genre in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years. The World's Greatest Superheroes by Paul Dini and Alex Ross uh, has a group of stories in it. At, each feature one of the superheroes and they were originally released in these big tabloid versions and man they were just gorgeous. Um, big painted panels, just beautiful stories to look at. And uh, they each had the heroes trying to conquer a specific issue and trying to use their superpowers to enact some 
solution to some big world problem. Superman tries to cure hunger. Um, Batman tries to figure out how to stop crime completely. And Wonder Woman uh, goes uh, uh, into kind of overdrive trying to work on women's issues. And what each one of these characters finds out in these, in these uh, uh, comics, which were done, done in the, I believe, in the late 90s, um, is that they can't do it by themselves. All of their vaunted power, all of their, all of their ability doesn't make them strong enough, wise enough, good enough, resourceful enough. It's ultimately going to take working hand in hand with other people. And I think we have a sense of the superhero needing to not just be this lone figure. You know, the hides out and the hide out and, and, and rides around and sort of does what they do in secret or whatnot. Each character runs into this uh, same problem and um, they do it with about seven or eight characters. Uh, consumer forces. The superhero is plastered on everything. Anywhere you want to look is superheroes. Um, I was joking around when I was, uh, uh, when I had to put together a superhero costume for uh, a big ball I was attending in Austin, uh, Texas. Um, you had to go as some sort of decrepit superhero. And I had no money. I had like 10 bucks. So how am I going to put together a superhero costume with 10 bucks? So I went to Target and they were selling these adult size underwear with superhero logos. I saw these flash underoos. Nice. So I took a pair of red long johns that I had at home and I got some yellow foam and, uh, and, and, and I had just enough money to buy those underoos and a pair of red nylons. And I put the nylons on and I knotted the top and I cut off the legs and I put eyes in it and I glued some great big yellow foam lightning bolts to my, to my head. <laughs> and, I, and I put my long johns on, which luckily had a button burst right, right near where the belly button was. And I put my underoos on over that. And I made a big sign on the back that said recession flash. <laughs> and I got a lot of compliments that night. And, uh, um, I was telling Tom we should actually give those, give those underoos away for our prize, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't that into it. I was, I was like, well, you wanted to sign them or something. But, um, you know, this is about where we're at with consumerism and superheroes. We, 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 there's a, it's hard to take superheroes seriously. And really it has been, I think, since Batman. But even what was going on with comic book censorship that, that led into the way comic books looked in the 50s and 60s contributed to this. Um, you know, the, the very ubiquity of the superhero undermines him as an ideal. It signals that his place is as much in the land of created things and products or commodities. He's not only fictional, but what he represents seems harder to believe in or more accurately trust in because he's being sold to us. Um, you have satiric figures that have arisen in, near, in the, in the near, uh, uh, recent history. Johnny Storm and the Human Touch, Torch, if you saw, um, uh, the Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. You know, he brings the uniforms to this Fantastic Four and they're like, these are plastered with, with company logos. You know, wear these goofy things. If you remember Captain Amazing, same thing. He's sponsored by Pepsi and Motorola uh, and Mystery Men. Um, and uh, uh, I think another thing that contributes to this in the consumer field is there's been a flood of superhero narrative, a ton of comic books. And uh, a lot of it's been substandard, and it kind of caters to the lowest possible denominator, and it's not all that, um, it's not all that effective um, uh, in terms of narrative, and I think that's lowered uh, our idea we've become kind of oversaturated. Um, so superhero narratives have uh, been marketed to increasingly larger audiences. Another thing that happens is they get stripped of their complexity. For instance, um, you know, Iron Man is a really entertaining movie, but it doesn't really take into account the fact that Tony Stark is an alcoholic warmonger. <laughs> and so, you know, as, as, much as, as much as, you know, we want to we wanna love Tony Stark in that movie, the comics do a much better job of sort of so sorting through the psych psychological uh, um, uh, characters and creating a narrative for that character. Um, Green Lantern, for instance, uh, has a vast mythology. Anybody here a Green Lantern fan? 
big, big, big mythology, which was really, 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 really stripped down for the movie. And they tacked on, a, you know, you know, love interest. Um, and they did a bad job. Did a bad job. Um, now, I like, for instance, I really liked Thor and Captain America. They're both very entertaining. But I don't know how well they do to rising above type. They are what we expect from a superhero movie. Uh, and um, you get the sense with Thor and Captain America, there was the chance to do a little bit more there. Um, it's important to note that this cartooning sort of happens to all our cultural figures. Um, you know, Twilight's a good example, uh, or a very, very bad example <laughs> um, of what happens when this happens. Um, you know, vampires go from being interesting to being stupid. Um, oh, I'm so bad. Anyway, and you also have uh, the Universal Monsters are a great example. In the 1930s, we get the Golden Age. We get the, you know, the, the really good um, uh, uh, movies, Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, The Mummy, and The Wolfman, you know, in the very beginning of the 40s. And then what do we do? We get Frankenstein meets The Wolfman and The Mummy's lair <laughs> beating up Dracula. You know, it's like, <laughs> what, what? You know, where? What? LSD? When? Not yet. It's the 40s, for crying out loud. Uh, and and that's, that's what I see. Uh, uh, happening to the superhero, we, we kind of go through this arc where uh, we oversaturate the market and then we don't know what to do with it anymore and then we desperately try to reboot the cash cow. Um, and, 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 and that's what we got to remember on some level again, these things, these things are our products. And one of the most important things here, Tom, how am I doing for time? All right, one of the most important things we're dealing with here is growing social concerns and anxieties about the future. Um, I'm actually going to be screening Westworld um, at a movie screening. Am I allowed to tell them? Yeah, tomorrow night at 6.30. Yeah, tomorrow night at 6.30. And uh, we're going to be talking about apocalyptic cinema, among other things. It's really worth your while to come out. Westworld's a great, cheesy, old 70s science fiction uh, thriller. Really come on out and, 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 uh, and see it um, and, and, and talk about it. But we really see this in the superhero. Um, because, of course, you know, on some level, what superhero movies have always been about saving the world from disaster. Now, the apocalypse has never been a bigger part of our pop culture than it is right now. Uh, and that says a lot. That says a lot because, man, people who lived through the 70s, if you were an adult in the 70s, you remember what the apocalypse was because, man, that, that permeated every aspect of our culture. Um, but now, it's just sort of something we take for granted when you turn on the History Channel. You know that they're, that, that, that they're going to have, you know, you can watch this week's episode of things that will probably kill all of us very, very soon. <laughs> you know? And whether it's a meteor or a plague or your dog's going to attack you unexpectedly or your baby's going to become sentient and evil and crawl out of its crib and, and throttle you to death in the middle of the night. I mean, we are, we are like com convinced that this stuff uh, 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 is just sort of part of our part and parcel. Um, and what's more, these programs usually go to great lengths to, to remind us that there's really nothing anybody can do uh, about, about any of this, um, that it's just probably going to happen and uh, someday, someday, you know. Uh, I, I know my wife and I were on a getaway and we show this, saw this show on uh, one of those channels, Discovery Channel or something about bomb shelters. And it was the happy-go-lucky adventures of this little bomb shelter company. And, and I mean, it was insane. Um, we don't, you know, we have the Mayan predictions. We have Harold Camping telling us the world is going to end. I think Heavens Harold recently repented of, of such activities. Um, did not pass the mantle on to Harold Camping Jr. or whatever. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's not really effective when you keep telling people the world's going to die and then you die. I don't I think that, that really, that's not really the best thing. But, um, you know, we are, we are aware, too, I think. Um, there's another great show called Life After People. Have you ever see Life After People? You know, uh, this idea of, like, here's what the world looks like a hundred, after everybody disappears. Here's what happens 100 years later. Here's what happens 1,000 years later. Well, Shea Stadium is gone, finally. You know, the, you know, the gorillas are living in, in the White House. You know what I mean? Um, um, uh, this is... Uh, this is really what we understand about human history and world history is that civilizations come and go, you know, that people die and then nobody remembers them. You know, all of us in this room in 25 years after we die, who's going to know you? 
50 years after you die, is there going to be any record of you? I mean, now with the internet, you know, I suppose <laughs> that's going to be so weird. You know, what's going to happen if the internet's going to become glutted with all these dead people? All this inf extraneous, like, you know, interesting information. But um, I think also, you know, we have this idea that uh, global warming, uh, uh, that there are all these forces that we feel like are sort of inevitable at this point and might catch up with us. It's like, it's, it's general anxiety that we have. Um, we're, you know, afraid of the failure of social institutions. We're afraid of scandals in religious institutions. We can't put our trust in that anymore. We have, you know, a real distrust of government. We are, you know, uh, anybody not mad at the government today? Okay. We have <laughs> economic instability. Um, and we have good reasons for all those feelings. We, you know, it's, this didn't happen out of thin air. Um, interesting thing is, uh, uh, for, for instance, and, and the one aside that I will allow myself, the one, the one, is that zombies, zombies, that's why we have zombies, folks. That's where it comes from. It's the antithesis of the superhero. It's the embodiment of what that social decay looks like to us in our worst, you know, I don't know, Freudian, Jungian, whatever you subscribe to. Back there. That's the image. Your neighbor is going to eat you. Social complete collapse. Um, there was even a great documentary a few years ago called Collapse. Uh, that if you watch it, gosh, watch some cartoons afterwards because it's about the most depressing <laughs> thing on the face of the earth. But, but um, um, we have really all our media dealing with this idea of apocalypse. And comics are, are no different. In 1982, Alan Moore published a comic called V for Vendetta. And it was initially a 10-issue run about a masked revolutionary named V who's in a totalitarian England. Uh, and he, this is happening, he's writing this, by the way, during Thatcher's um, run. Um, and contrary to popular belief, Margaret Thatcher is nothing like Meryl Streep. I just want you to know that. <laughs> um, and uh, the totalitarian England during a devastating war. And this guy's activities in the comic, they really blur the distinction uh, the observable line between ideological good and evil. We don't really know what to make of V, and his, um, his, his you know, it, it's a little bit like uh, uh, d different. It's like the flip side of the mission. Did you see the mission? Um, it's about the, the the two guys who wind up trying to um, protect the Ecuadorian missionaries in the turn of the century, um, um, and uh, one ends up deciding to fight the Spaniards as they invade and slaughter everybody, and one decides to be pacifist and to have that be a statement. And at the end of the movie, you get the idea that neither one is necessarily wrong. Well, this is the, the same thing, only this is a guy who's running around and blowing up stuff and really seems absolutely convinced that that's what he's supposed to do. And he's kind of the hero of this, of this piece. And that is supposed to be disturbing. It is supposed to be provocative. It is supposed to engender a, 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 a much-needed dialogue in our society at that time about the role of the individual in dealing with, dealing with corruption and oppression. Uh, especially when it looks like democracy um, of, of some stripe. Um, the Watchmen comes out in 1986. Um, if you've seen the movie, I apologize. No, I'm kidding. The movie's actually not horrible. But the comic book is absolutely one of the greatest comics in the history of comics. It is absolutely in the canon of, of what you need to know about where comics have been in the last 20 or 30 years. Publishes a 12 issue run, 1986. And uh, initially it was sort of uh, started as a way of describing what superheroes would be like if they were actually part of the real world. But the real world that the comics create is a real world where Nixon has managed to get himself reelected like 20 times. He's been the president for like you know, 40 years or something. And um, the government has demanded that all the superheroes retire. And those superheroes uh, do have the option, if they want to, to be uh, working for the government. Uh, problem is, someone starts killing retired superheroes. And this uh, 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 darkest superhero of them all, this vigilante named Rorschach, who wears a Rorschach blot for a mask, and is, he's just psycho. The guy's just a nut. And he runs around, he, if you're doing evil, he'll kill you. That's, that's, that's his superpower, is he just to kill you. And um, um, he's the only one that bothers to want to try to track all this down and figure out what's going on. He's the only one that sees the pattern. And what he finds out is that the greatest superhero of them all, uh, Osmandius, who's known to be the smartest man in the world, and who was smart enough to retire before the government made everybody retire, 
uh, has decided to precipitate a world catastrophe. And in that world catastrophe, um, that uh, will then bring the whole world together. And th then the world can be rebuilt and peace can, you know, people can be governed uh, uh, into peace. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase, if you've ever heard it in the last few years, who watches the watchman, and that we see in graffiti throughout the book, that's from a, a um, uh, we also see a bloodstained happy face, by the way, um, which is a real cogent image from the book. But um, the phrase, who watched the watchman, comes from the Roman satirist, satirist Juvenal. And it's the idea that no matter who governs, you end up needing someone to govern the one who governs. And this was very important to the Romans because they really wanted to try to figure out how to create a society. You know, C.S. Lewis said, said of the Romans that they were the, they were the most noble of all the pagans. Um, um, because they really did seem to care about building something out of the world. And, and, they, and they really did have some, some good things at heart. Uh, but of course, you know, we know how that <laughs> turned out. Um, and so it was, it's, no, it's no wonder that this came from a satirist, this phrase, who watches the watchman, and then later got um, used by the decidedly irreverent Alan Moore. Let me tell you, you want to look up weirdness? There's a picture of Alan Moore uh, right next to it in the dictionary. The guy is just, you could spend your lifetime learning about that guy. He's brilliant, and he's completely out of his mind. Um, um, but, you know, one of the implications of the books is that absolute power associated with superheroes is, in fact, some sort of fascism. And, you know, all of a sudden we're not looking at superheroes like they're good guys anymore. We're beginning to shift away from the idea that superhero is the good guy and, and begin to ask hard questions about the use of force and the use of power and who he's aligned with and who keeps an eye on him. Um, and this is where we get into one of the last sections here, accountability and the changing nature of Batman. Batman is easily the most, uh, the most uh, a popular superhero in the world. So if you're here tonight and you want me to talk about Superman, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm going to talk a little bit about Superman. But the thing about Batman is, um, you know, in the first issue, the guy kills people. He's a vigilante. Um, uh, he's there to do the job that the police can't do. Um, and a funny thing happens to Batman. Um, who here has ever heard of Tales from the Crypt? Okay, Tales from the Crypt, Haunt of Fear, and Vault of Horror were three horror comics that began to um, put the superhero comic in danger um, because they were huge, 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 huge best-selling horror comics. And then everybody started to Im imitate them and pretty soon people were buying way more horror comics in the United States than they were buying superhero comics. Um, this got a few people uh, uh, upset because uh, these comics, you know, were dark and they were scary and they were full of monsters and blood. And, and, and a guy named Fred Wortham wrote an article for Reader's Digest, which was picked up um, uh, and, uh, by parents groups, usually Catholic-oriented parents groups across the country. And um, eventually the matter, uh, this matter of, uh, of how do comics cause juvenile delinquency uh, went before Congress. And he wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocent, which gathered all his uh, anecdotes together where kids would come forward and say, the comics turned me into a bad kid, and I don't, I'm so sorry I read those comics. And uh, Congress didn't issue an edict, but they started to rattle the cage a little bit. And so all the comics uh, people got together, and they passed what was called the Comics Code. And let me tell you what. If you, know, you think the Ten Commandments is hard to live by, you ought to read the Comics Code. I mean, good luck publishing anything that anybody wants to read in that Comics Code. It is, it is just, you can't do anything um, uh, in your comics in this, in this silly code. And um, basically they used that, they did that because they could shut EC Comics down. They could shut down their major competitor. And they could get back to publishing superhero comics. And so superheroes started to do things like Batman and Robin went into space. And we get characters like Batmite and Mr. Mixaplex uh, in the Superman comics. And they're Mixaplex, Plex, Mixel, 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 and, um, and we get sprites and fairies. And our, our superheroes begin to go all twilight and glimmer. And, and this is what's so awful about the, 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 the censorship in the 1950s is 
really dumbed superhero comics down to the point where we wind up with Adam West and Batman in the 1960s because that's really the only kind of superheroes we've had by then uh, uh, at that point for about 15 or, or 20 years. Um, superhero comics aren't at all serious anymore. Uh, they're juvenile to the point where you know, most kids stop reading them past a certain you know, very young age. And, um, uh, and then an interesting thing happens. Um, people start publishing horror magazines like Eerie and Creepy. By now, EC. Oh, and by the way, the other thing that the, the, the cartoon, the, the comics uh, censorship gave us, it gave us Mad Magazine, which wasn't at all subversive. <laughs> so, certainly not as subversive as Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> um, and that's why I sort of laugh, because that's exactly what happened. I mean, they went out and they created a magazine that was way dirtier and crasser and, and actually uh, a lot more entertaining than, uh, than Tales from the Crypt and, and Haunt of Fear and all those magazines, they created Mad Magazine. And, um, you know, everybody followed suit. Uh, after a few years, you, you, you know, in the 70s, finally you start to see these, these oversized comics. They don't have to abide by the comic code because they're magazines. And, and so um, you start to see intelligent fantasy and science fiction and horror again being, being published in graphic form. And then they relaunched Detective Comics. Because by now, the comics code has sort of lost its teeth and they're not really adhering to it anymore. Um, Batman uh, in Detective Comics is this brooding, tortured character. He's totally driven by what happened to his parents. We finally start to get into his psychology, examine his sense of overachievement. Um, and then we get three seminal works. And those works are Arkham Asylum, The Killing Joke, and The Dark Knight Returns. Um, Everything that you have seen uh, in Batman Begins and the Dark Knight that make Batman interesting is in, those, is in those comics. Arkham Asylum has Batman putting down a riot in Arkham Asylum where the Joker and all the other characters have taken over. And each one of the villains, um, Batman has to track them down and they stand in for a facet of his personality. The artwork in the book is absolutely horrifying. It's by a guy named Dave McKean and, uh, who's worked with Neil Gaiman to do stuff like Stardust and um, Dream... What was the movie they did? No, Dreamcatcher is that awful sci-fi thing. It's the, I cannot remember the name of it. Anyway, um, amazing artist. And uh, uh, really a very psychological, a very deep, a deep look at the Batman. Killing Joke talks about the origination of the Joker and it compares the Joker to Batman over and over again. In, in, a, in a series that has, uh, in a story that has the Joker kidnapping James Gordon, the commissioner, and then crippling the commissioner's daughter to drive Batman into trying to kill him. And the whole book is about Batman trying to get through to the Joker that they have to come to some sort of truce. And of course, the only thing they have in common is they're both, they're both very well acquainted with the dark side. They're sort of the, the, you know, like two faces coin, only both sides are scarred. And neither one of them knows what to do about it. Um, it's a very compelling, really interesting story. Um, kind of asks the question, does what happens to a man dictate what he becomes? And then, of course, we have The Dark Knight Returns. Now, um, The Dark Knight Returns has, I'm going to show you a picture here. Bruce Wayne is 60, and he's retired. And as he's retired, um, um, Gotham has descended into chaos. It's taken over by these filed down teeth mutant gang kids and uh, they just run rampant. The federal government is utterly, you know, controlling everything. And so Batman uh, comes out of retirement and he uh, uh, ends up in a duel to the death with the Joker, a duel to the death with the mutant uh, king. Uh, he's this grizzled figure. Uh, this is sort of the art style of the book. It's very, very compelling, very, very nasty and, 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 and earthy. And uh, finally winds up in a fight to the death with Superman, who by now has become just a tool and a puppet of the government. Um, so it's a very, very dark take on Batman. Um, and it deals with the idea, the, the idea of the superhero as a fascist. And um, it's very evocative, though, and grotesque. Uh, and it, it was hugely inspirational. The Watchmen and the Dark Knight came out the same year. Uh, Dark Knight Returns came out the same year. And just can't even imagine the, the impact that they had. 
The last little thing I wanted to touch on is called, um, uh, gets into the me metaphysics of the superhero. And this is where we start to see a little bit of hope in the treatment of the superhero, but it's a hope that's not born in handing back the superhero everything that we gave him before. Um, you get to, you know, um, um, Miller's treatment of Batman and, uh, in uh, the Dark Knight series and Moore's treatment of superheroes and Watchmen and the revolutionary V character, they all sort of suggest this inevitable pendulum, pendulum swing, pendulum swing between uh, armed insurrection and fascism that we don't seem to have a real choice but to end up in one place or another in our society. Um, and Alex Ross wants to believe in something more than that, and he wants to believe that superheroes can be sort of a model for us to be led into something more than that. And he wrote these two books, and they're really marvelous books, and I encourage you, if you read nothing else um, that has to do with superheroes, go out and get these things. Uh, one is called Marvels, uh, and it, uh, it's about a reporter. He's anxious to make a name for himself. He's lucky enough to be on hand when superheroes emerge in the 1940s. And it follows him through the decades as he covers the never-ending superhero parade and deals with the psychic weight of the public crisis of confidence that follows because these superheroes come out and then people are asking, what does it even mean to be a man when we know the existence of these creatures that just make us look like ants? What uh, does anything we do or say matter when we're not even able to really have any part in saving ourselves uh, uh, anymore? Um, and do superheroes even really care about us? Because they say that they do, but they cause all this damage and there's super battles and there's all this collateral damage to life and, 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 and uh, limb by, by civilians. So he's looking back at this damage and he's watching the public backlash and he's not able to parlay his journalistic influence into anything other than helping the, uh, the superheroes to become celebrities. Um, and so he becomes very embittered and the book ends with him uh, passing the baton on to a younger reporter and just trying to go away and figure out what, what happened. Well, how did something that looked like it could be so great end, end on such a sour note? Um, and and um, that little passing of the baton is his little ray of hope that something good can happen. And then lastly, we have Kingdom Comes by Alex Ross. Uh, where an elderly minister becomes a prophetic witness of God as he's given a front row seat to the colossal clash between Earth's super beings. So bent on are they upon their decades old battles, so willing to assume the mantle of Godhood in their judgments against one another and how they are going to um, um, uh, save the world, that they really almost forget about us. They almost forget about mankind. Uh, for instance, a million Kansans are wiped off the face of the earth when the Adam Man is split open in a skirmish between superheroes. And then Superman builds a vast prison for the re-education of, of the superheroes who won't toe the line uh, and, and uh, uh, see things his way. And then um, there's a vast rebellion that happens as a result of that. So in the end, um, and you have the supervillains banding together, um, trying to figure out how to take advantage of the growing hatred that all the superheroes have now, uh, all everybody has towards the superheroes. And in the end, you wind up with this tiny minister facing down Superman and demanding that he recognize that he is also a creation. He is not all-powerful. He is not omnipotent. And he has to accept the humility of working with others and the willing, have the willingness to be judged by men that he purports to serve or he can't, he can't serve men at all. And it's this really, really dynamic moment. And it suggests this idea that at the end we have to take responsibility for our own destiny and that we have to, we have to really see the superhero as something that either helps us to do that or not. Because each one of us has an individual decision to make about the power we have and how it's going to be used and how it's going to be brought out into the world and what it's going to be subjugated to and who we're going to join hands with or are we going to join hands with anybody. Um, this is really powerful because it suggests that we need our superheroes to be flawed because otherwise they become shallow gods. They're ultimate in power but they are dangerously simplistic in the way that they maneuver through ethics and morality. And readers and viewing audiences need them to be flawed because we need them to tell us the stories we need to hear about living out virtue as we struggle in a fallen world. Um, C.S. Lewis had this great quote, if I discover within myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. 
You know, the thing we admire most about Superman is his ability to slip the surly bonds of Earth, his ability to fly. And yet, more and more our superheroes have become something of the Earth because superheroes make lousy gods. Well, I think we intuitively understand that. It is not good to place our, our hopes in that metaphor beyond a certain point. Um, they cannot satisfy our ultimate truth, uh, ultimate desire for truth or justice or the American way. Um, and yet they make wonderful stand-ins for men and their growing power over technology, geography, and each other. Um, and I want to say one quick word about children. Um, I mentioned earlier that superhero stories tend to be violent. Um, and uh, uh, I've been reading a, a great book um, that so far I, I, I like really well. And one of the things it talks about is how children have an innate need to step into the roles, uh, uh, step into roles through play because the tensions they encounter in the actual world around them um, give them the need to um, uh, um, uh, um, practice how, how, to, how to play those tensions out um, and to feel safe in eventually knowing that they're going to have to go out into the world and face those things. Um, and so I think this is really the role of the superhero that we've sort of intuitively gone to as a culture um, because it, built into us is this desire for play. We have a desire for play and make-believe built into us. It's put there by God. I think that's absolutely, you can get that right out of the scriptures. God talks endlessly about his own creativity and encouraging the creativity in his body. And um, the idea is to have uh, superheroes engage the childlike need we have for role models that can suggest but not demand specific outcomes to all of these problems. And um, we seem as a culture to me to be going past the need to have these ideals embodied by fictional characters in general in, in some ways um, in that we want role models in our fiction, in our narratives who give us a sense that our own struggles to be heroic can have meaning. In other words, we want them to be more human because ultimately we need to be able to relate to them because our problems seem more and more pressing, more and more real to us. Um, our culture is in the middle of redefining the superhero to a larger degree than ever before. Uh, anybody see the new Sherlock Holmes? You know? I mean, the guy's a superhero, right? I mean, nobody can do this stuff. Uh, what about uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> can I have all the men go, <gasps> 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 And then we have all these satires um, that have come through recently in the movie Kick-Ass. Uh, the movie Super, uh, Special, I don't know how many of you have heard of that, The Specials, Mystery Men. Anybody see Mystery Men? Yeah. We have a date with Destiny Men, and it looks like she ordered the lobster. <laughs> love that line. Um, I also love it when they ask Tom Waits why he's in the old folks' home. And he says, oh, man, no, 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 I don't live here. I just come for the women. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, and so we have all these, we have all these superhero thing, uh, types that we're sort of like, yeah, trying to go. I'm, I'm literally on the last thing. Can I just finish that one last thing? Um, but I think it's characters like Donnie Darko and Scott Pilgrim that sort of emerge as our more and more human um, um, characters that we're turning to, that are turning into our cult characters. Um, these characters... Last character is the stuff of cult order adoration, precisely because they offer a surprisingly potent mix of geekosity and superheroic bravery. Um, they are characters that, like us, have grown up imagining superheroes, and they get to be them. But in the end, it isn't about the adulation that they would receive the way that old superheroes would re receive it, but being confronted by the need to change within themselves and a desire to do what's right that drives their narrative. Um, also, a couple of things. They're street savvy. They're not easily duped or manipulated by the co corrupt influences around them. So it's kind of full circle or back to the purity of heart thing. They're more human than super. The world around them is full of real life challenges, every bit as important as the fantasy elements in their stories. They're able to take responsibility for the decisions they make. In other words, there's no such thing as residual collateral damage. If you do something in one of these stories and somebody gets hurt, generally the movies follow those storylines and there's you know what I mean? So that's very, very interesting. Um, and they're human, but they're powered through truth. And they're set free 
um, through that often by encountering a truth in their stories. And so the, the and, and, and by encountering and working through the very flaws that would keep them from extraordinary acts. Um, so I, I, I think ultimately we may be looking at, you know, far, far, far fewer superhero movies in the near future. And we are going to be looking at more and more and more movies about extraordinary things and just average people mm -hmm. and the way that they work through those. So thank you very much.